it's uh, so it's a it's a pleasure to have uh, Ignacio Barros here, which uh, from uh, from Orsay, who is going to talk about uh, the rational on the, on the rationality of modular spaces of uh, K three surfaces. Okay, so thank you for the the invitation and the lovely introduction. So you can see my mouse here, right? If I point at things. Okay, great. Um, okay, so let me start saying that this is all um, joint with Daniele Agostini and Quan Wen Lai. Um, and uh, oh, okay. So okay, so so I, I want to break it uh, into five. Right, a section. So first, I, I will recall, and it's very good that David gave a talk last week because he he covered a lot of of, of these so, uh, measures of irrationality. So I will just recall these notions. And um, then talk about a uh, Hegner divisors and Bocher's theorem, which is the key is sort of the, the the key ingredient in 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 our results. Um, um, and then uh, yeah, relate. So recall a bit the so what is there in the literature about the, the relationship between K threes and special cubic fourfolds this this Hodge theoretic connection uh, and to use this to bound um, this these measures of irrationality for moduli of K threes uh, and finally I will talk a little bit about the the, the general statement um, which is very recent so uh, but okay yeah, you will see when, when we arrive there. okay. So X, a projective variety over the complex numbers. Yeah, so the degree of irrationality, yeah, um, um, this, is, this is boring if you were here last week, but anyhow, for, for those of you that were not, uh, so the degree of irrationality of X is the smallest possible degree of a dominant map from X to the projective space. Um, and uh, yeah, there are sort of two main ones. There are various notions of, of how to measure irrationality, um, but the, the two sort of main ones, so finest and coarser in a way, is uh, the other one is the covering onality. And the covering onality of a variety X uh, is the smallest possible gonality of a covering curve. Sort of, so you ask for the smallest possible number such that for a general point in X, there is a curve of gonality, that number passing through it. And just to remind you, the gonality of a curve is the smallest possible degree of a map to P1. So it's the degree of irrationality actually but for a curve. Um, so yeah, another way of, of, of saying this, uh, this is the smallest possible C for which there exists a curve vibration dominating X such that the general fiber has gonality C, okay? So yeah, the, the obvious observation here is that if the degree of irrationality is one, it means that the variety is rational, right? There is a degree one map to, to, uh, to a projective space of the same dimension. Um, and uh, the covering gonality is one, if and only if your curve is, your variety is covered by rational curves, right? Or in other words, X is unirule. Um, and uh, yeah, and in general, the covering gonality is always smaller than the degree of irrationality, smaller or equal, right? Like if you have a map here that realizes the degree of irrationality, then you can take a P1 and then, uh, Right? The, the curve that sits upstairs is going to have gonality, the degree of irrationality. <laughs> the degree of irrationality, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, um, so, what about, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, one, one could try to make a mix of the two and ask for the minimal degree of a map to a uniruled variety. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, 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 that's correct. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, um, but it certainly does, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, but I don't know. I, I have nothing to, to add there. Uh, okay. 
Um, so, okay, so I'll, let me just give you sort of very briefly a, a little bit of history about this, this invariant. So the, um, when, when the variety X is a curve, this is a very old invariant, right? It goes back to Riemann, uh, Riemann's existence theorem. So the fact that every curve can be realized as a finite map to P1 and, um, and yeah, I don't know, another classical sort of uh, uh, theorem in, in the literature in curves is uh, uh, Harris, -Manf uh, Harris Manford theorem. Uh, the way they show that MG is of general type for G big enough is by uh, exactly sort of studying the locus where curves have gonality less than expected. Um, so it's a, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, this for in curve theory is a very, very important invariant, the gonality. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so the degree of irrationality, uh, Heinz and Mo, they, they introduced it uh, in the 80s. Um, then uh, Yoshihara has a various papers, like five or six papers, where he computes the, the degree of irrationality for, for various, so different classes of surfaces. Um, uh, Lopez Pirola, uh, 95, they, um, they compute the, um, the covering gonality of, uh, of a surface in P3, I right, of degree D. So uh, Bastianelli um, computed the covering gonality of symmetric product of curves uh, in terms of the gonality of the curve um, and the degree of irrationality. Um, and, uh, and then there is this paper of Bastianelli, Depoy, Ein, Lazarfels, and Uleri, where they sort of, uh, I mean, these invariants have been around for, for a while, with, with not, not precisely with these names, right, with different names. Uh, they're, they're sort of very natural invariants. And, um, and they studied this for um, hypersurfaces uh, and, um, of, of any dimension, right? And, and then um, they, they managed to bound from, from below, from above also, but, but that's sort of trivial, but from below the covering gonality of smooth hypersurfaces of, of large enough degree. And, um, and they compute the degree of irrationality when X is very general. And then, um, yeah, since then there has been more, you, you already saw uh, David Stapleton's talk. Um, uh, there are more contributions, but, but I, will, I, I will sort of stick to, to, to this list. Um, Okay, so let me go to K3 surfaces. So XH is a polarized K3 of genus G. Um, right then, okay, so th there is a classical result of uh, Vogomolo Manford uh, that says that um, every K3 surface can be covered by uh, elliptic curves, possibly singular, right? Actually, if the, if the genus is two or bigger, they are gonna be singular. But in any case, it can be dominated by a family of elliptic curves. So a family of, of gonality two. So the covering gonality of any uh, K3 surface is two. Um, and um, uh, Stapleton uh, uh, proved that, um, that actually the degree of irrationality is bounded by a square root of, of the degree. Uh, from above. And uh, the, it, so th there is this question already in this paper of, of the five authors um, um, that I mentioned, um, states there, so as, just as an open question, can we bound the covering gonality or the degree of irrationality for MG or AG? It's a, it's a question, it's a, 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 it's a question of Donaghi. Um, and, um, and let me add there FG, okay? Um, it's, it's also a sort of a fundamental modular space. Um, and uh, I, I want to sort of convince you that the picture for FG is, uh, might be sort of substantially simpler than for MG and AG. Um, but yeah, let me, let me sort of remind you, right, that all these moduli spaces, they are all of general type, except finally many. 
all of them, right? So, so there is the classical result of Harris Manford, MGs of general type, MG is at least 24. Then um, uh, uh, Freitag, Manford type, these are, these are uh, three papers, I believe. Um, uh, but uh, AGs of general type, as long as G is at least seven. So moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties of dimension G. Uh, and uh, more recently, Gritsenko, Hulek, Sankaran, uh, they show that FGs of general type for G starting from 63. Um, and then they have sporadic cases where it's also of general type uh, for G below that. But, um, but the point is that they are very far from being rational, right? They are all of general type, except finally many happening uh, for, for fairly sort of small G. Um, so yeah, okay. So um, let me just sort of tell you uh, what can we say about MG, just sort of without uh, looking at the literature, right? Uh, what can we say about MG? So HGD, this is the Hurwitz space parameterizing a simply ramified covers of P1 of degree D and genus G. Okay. So uh, yeah, if uh, if it's too fast, you yeah you can feel free to say. Uh, okay, the Hurwitz space, right? So uh, elements there are maps, uh, are isomorphism classes of maps from a curve of genus G. A map of degree D simply ramified to P1. So this space comes with two maps, the one that forgets the map to P1 and remembers the source, right? Um, and, and this map is dominant as long as D is bigger than this number. This is the gonality of a general curve of genus G, right? Um, and then there is the map that forgets the source curve and remembers the P1 uh, together with all the information that the P1 comes from, right? Which is the branching, uh, essentially, yeah, that, the branching up to ordering. Okay. And this map is also dominant, moreover, it's finite, right? This is, this is Riemann existence theorem. The fact that um, fixing uh, branch points and prescribing uh, the ramification, right? How, how the monodromy, so, um, yeah, so prescribing branching and ramification gives you a curve, right? And, and then this choice is unique, right? It has to do with, with understanding a sort of transitive subgroups of SN. Uh, N here is, is this number, 2G minus 2 plus 2. Um, anyhow, uh, these, these numbers, the degree of this map, uh, are very mysterious. This is, uh, there is no closed formula for them. Um, and uh, people in gromo witten theory studies, uh, they study them. Um, but so, some things are known. Um, but in principle, okay, so this is an obvious observation, right? That if you take a P1 here, right? The curve upstairs is gonna have gonality this degree, right? And this dominates MG, provided this big enough. So, um, so yeah, so, so we have this bound. But uh, these numbers are very big, are very, very big, right? There so, is, so, so, sorry, can, I, can yeah, you please yeah. repeat these numbers H, G, D? What are they counting explicitly? So what are you fixing? What, what are you counting? The degree is uh, if you fix P1 and 2G minus 2 plus 2D branch points, so points, right? You count how many simply ramified covers of genus G are there. Yeah, and, and then... Um, yeah, and then what, what I was saying is that by, by this, so uh, Riemann's existence theorem translating to, uh, so recovering the curve upstairs has to do with prescribing monodromy, right? Uh, if you take a cycle around one of these points, how does it act on the fiber? And, and this is, um, yeah, so this is the same as sort of uh, asking for uh, subgroups of SN uh, that they need to act, act transitively right, on uh, SD, sorry, the degree, right? They need to ask transitively on the, on the fiber. And uh, yeah, there are a few conditions that need to be satisfied, but um, 
So, yeah, and there is a paper of Dubrovnik, Yang, Tsagia from, from 2017, where they give explicit asymptotic formulas when you fix either G or D. So if you fix the genus, so, okay, here, if you fix the degree and make the genus goes to infinity, this number um, behaves exponential. Okay, and the same if you do it the other way around, if you fix the genus and, and make the degree grow. So, um, one can use this to say that this, because here, so you see that D also has to grow as genus grows, right? So, uh, but, but these numbers are at least exponential and uh, likely to be more than exponential, actually, uh, fast, but, but they are very big numbers. So the question is, uh, okay, so first of all, this is about for the covering onality, no clue about the degree of irrationality and can, so are there better bounds, right? Is there a polynomial bound? Or, or is that sort of insane to hope for? Uh, any, any, yeah, this is sort of wide, wide open, right? Um, and uh, yeah, how about uh, FG or AG? Can, can we bound for, uh, can we find polynomial bounds or reasonable bounds um, for the degree of irrationality? And I'm, I'm in, in a way, I mean, you will see that it becomes key. I'm, I'm cheating a little bit, right? Because it is one very important feature of FG that does not share with AG and MG, which is the fact that the dimension of FG is independent of G. Yeah, it's always 19. Whereas the dimension of AG grows, grows quadratically actually on G, and the dimension of MG grows linearly on G. Right. So, um, yeah, but anyhow, right? I mean, so can, can we can we find polynomial bounds? Can we, say, can, can we, can we be sort of hopeful and, and say, okay, these varieties, sure, are all very far from being rational. They're all of general type, but it's not that bad. Um, and uh, yeah, the theorem, the results are the following. So if, uh, so, okay, D is the degree of the K3, right? Which is 2G minus 2. So you start from seven, uh, yeah, from eight on. Um, you fix a positive integer. And then if either D is congruent to zero or two mod six and not divisible by four, nine or any pro, uh, odd prime congruent to two mod three. So this is the, 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 the cubic fourfold uh, condition. Um, um, for the K3 to be associated to a cubic four, anyhow. So, um, or this congruent to two or four mod eight and not divisible by any prime congruent to three mod four. Yeah, so this condition has to do the, with, with the K3 being associated to a, to a, Gushel, to a special Gushel Mukai. Um, or this number is a square. Then there is a polynomial bound of degree 10 on the genus. So, yeah, and, uh, yeah, and so, okay. Uh, I mean, this numerology is not really instructive, but, you know, uh, we can find like an infinite series, right, of, of, uh, of numbers for which there is a polynomial bound. Sorry, so n only shows up in the last condition, right? Yeah, yeah, and and it's sort of yeah. So in in so this constant then will de we will depend on n. So actually, yeah, this is an important point. This covers all genera, right? Every every d, you can write it as a square plus a fixed integer, right? Um, but yeah, but then this constant will depend on n. Yeah, it's clear. So for every fix n, you have the constant, but then I cannot do it for all n because, uh, yeah. So, but yeah, that's correct. And, and um, this is sort of the, the yeah, I, I will sort of yeah, go into it. Okay. What is this about? Um, but this is cubic four folds. This is Guschel Mukai. And this is essentially sort of the generalization uh, of this, which is, uh, special hyperkeller fourfolds. This, this follows uh, the bar uh, Macri um, on the period of, of hyperkeller fourfolds. Um, okay, is, is the statement, uh, okay. 
Okay, so uh, after uh, the, the version that is on the archive, right, then we, uh, we wrote this and then we, you know, we are all young and we are looking for jobs and so on. So we were a bit on a hurry to put it up. And we wrote a conjecture afterwards. We said, okay, the degree of irrationality is uniformly bounded by, by a polynomial in G. Uh, but let me change this as a question. Is the degree of irrationality uniformly bounded? And um, yeah, we found a proof uh, very recently. So, and that's, so I, I want to tell you a little bit about it at the end of, of the talk. But um, so for every epsilon, there is a constant such that this holds for every G, for all G. So uh, there is a polynomial bound for all G. Um, and um, yeah, I should say that the, so, okay, this epsilon, the responsible for this epsilon is the number of Fourier Mukai partners of a general K3. Uh, it grows. So if you take a general K3 of Picard rank one and genus G, then the number, well, degree D, say, um, the number of Fourier Mukai partners grows as uh, G to the epsilon uh, or degree to the epsilon. Yeah, there is a constant. Um, and then this 14 has to do with the way you, so this 14 comes out uh, is by, so the smallest possible, even unimodular lattice that contains all K3 lattices. Right? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think, I don't know. Uh, so just to, to give a sense of, of where this, this, yeah, the number comes from. Um, but yeah, okay. Are, are there questions so far? So, so the number of Fourier Mukai partners has to do with um, factoring out your degree, right? So it's like the number exactly, of, prim exactly. of prime factors. Why are you saying it's G to the epsilon? I know it's bounded. I mean, there is one of you. So it's, uh, yeah, the, the number of Fourier Mukai partners is two to the power, the number of different prime divisors of D. Um, and uh, yeah, that's sort of the easiest. Uh, there are formulas and estimates for, for how this function behaves. Yeah, but, but then the, the easiest one that, I, that we could find uh, is actually in, uh, in Hardy and Wright in this classical number theory book. Is that uh, that number is, is a list like is bounded by the, by the divisor function that counts the total number of divisors. And uh, that behaves like little o of a, of a, a D to the epsilon. But yeah, maybe one can do slightly better. I mean, there are, yeah, there is literature around that, right? That log n over log log n and, and so on, and then making the, the error smaller and smaller. But um, I think, yeah, this is sort of the cleanest that we could, uh, uh, that we could find, the cleanest, uh, yeah. Okay, um, so, okay, let me give you sort of the, the rough idea of how this works um, because, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I mean, of course it's, it comes from close, the, 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 the recommendation, but I think it's pretty cool. Um, um, okay, so um, for, fer for the first theorem, yeah, this um, um, sort of special hyperkeller for folks. Um, so if you take G, in that range, in the, in the either first, second, or third range. The idea is to essentially embed all these FGs for Gs of that form inside the same projective space. So that is something that you cannot do for MG or, or AG. Yeah. Um, uh, and then once, yeah, once you have them all inside the same projective space, then you are in, in a sort of I don't know, it's, it's a bit of a better situation, right? Because then if you take a general linear projection, you map to a P19, right? Then um, the degree of this map is gonna be the degree of this variety inside PM, right? Or the closure. So the degree of irrationality in particular is bounded by the degree of this thing inside this big projective space, right? 
So now, now the yeah the, the the sort of okay. So now Borchers come in, in in the game, right? So so an important result of him, together with this this translation from K threes to hyperkellers, uh, Hasset for cubic four folds, the bar Ilyev Manivel for Kusho Mukai, and the bar Macri for in general for special cubic four folds. Sorry for special hyperkeller four folds. This all says that one can find a modular form of weight 11 with some Fourier expansion at infinity, where the degrees of Fg, they appear there as coefficients. And, uh, and this, the fact that this is a modular form actually is asking, so this, this needs to be holomorphic at infinity, right? So then now, now you can breed in peace, but because the coefficients cannot go as crazy as they want, right? Uh, so in particular, yeah, in, in our case, this means that the, the coefficients cannot grow of the Fourier expansion, right, of, of a modular form of this weight. Uh, they cannot, they grow as big O of n to the 10. Okay, they cannot, cannot grow faster. So then the degree cannot grow faster um, and, and, and that gives you the bound. So the rough strategy is, 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 is more or less clear. Is, um, I grab all these FGs, I put them in the same projective space, I study the degrees. And then there is machinery that tells me that these degrees, they fit as numbers, right? In the Fourier expansion of a modular form. And modularity then gives me that these numbers, their growth is controlled. Okay, so and um, okay, so let me tell you then how this works, right? I need to uh, to tell you about the Borchers theorem, um, which is a little bit heavy on notation. I'm sorry about that, but uh, yeah, it's sort of the, the, the main tool. Um, okay, so um, uh, uh, modular forms, yeah. Um, so, okay, so a uh, little tau here is, a, is an element of the upper half plane, right? Then SL2 set acts on the upper half plane by the standard action, right? Um, so we will fix a vector space, C and B, and a representation. Yeah, and we will assume uh, that this representation factors through a finite group. Um, so then a vector valued modular form of weight K and type rho is an holomorphic function from the upper half plane to V uh, that uh, satisfies the standard property, right? That if you act by an element of SL2, then this comes out and then uh, yeah, rho of the element. And uh, yeah, and the key point here is that, so, okay, uh, the, the space of modular forms of this type and this weight for this group is a finite dimensional vector space. Um, okay, so the group SL2, right, is generated by two standard elements, T that acts as translation, right, in this direction, and S that acts as reflection with respect to the unit circle. Um, and okay, if you assume that at some point t to the power something is the identity, yeah, acts as the identity on v. So and, and that that's always the case actually because we are assuming that this representation factors through a finite group, right? So um, so at some point this goes to the identity, and we fix a, a base a, an, an eigenbasis for this element, for this matrix here. Uh, so then uh, an element in this vector space has an expansion like this, right? Where this looks like this. So this is the Fourier expansion for vector valued modular form. Okay, so uh, a lattice uh, with signature M comma two. So, from a lattice, you consider the dual om from m to z, right? Um, and this can be seen inside a m a tensor with q, 
and you can, so, so this can be identified, right? With all the elements here that per integer with every element in M. Okay. So every element in M certainly pairs integer with every element in M. So, uh, so there is an embedding here. Yeah, we, I don't know if you wanted abstract, it uh, just takes an element to the, uh, the dual element, which is pairing with, right? So I don't know, uh, angle dot comma element angle. Um, and, uh, and the quotient, so this has finite index. The quotient is a finite group, which is called the discriminant group. Um, and it comes with a Q mod set valued quadratic form, right? You have a Q valued one, which is, so the one on M, you tensor it with Q. So it's a bilinear form here, right? And, um, and it has integer values on M. So yeah, it has values on Q mod set. And uh, so from this, okay, so from the lattice, you have the discriminant group and there is um, a distinguished representation, which is called the vile representation that acts on the group algebra of the discriminant group. And it's concrete, it's extremely concrete. It has a formula that which, uh, yeah, I didn't put it here because it's, it doesn't say much, but, um, so, okay, let, let me just give you an example, right? So two copies of A1. So cute little lattice here. This is the matrix. Now, if you tensor it with Q and you ask for all the elements that per integer, Right with with E and F with the generators, then it looks like this, and this is the um, the bilinear form. So this is the dual lattice, and then the quotient, the discriminant group is two copies of set mod two set, yeah, which is sort of easy to see here. I mean, the, yeah, twice this element is zero. So uh, and the same for F, yeah. And it comes again with a, a with a quadratic form. Um, so uh, yeah, so let, let's call the generators like this. Right? These are sort of the dual generator. You have f, and then one half f. Uh, uh, that one is is e star. Right? Um, so then yeah, the, the group algebra, right, is is simply generated by these elements, right? Um, so it's a four dimensional vector space. And then you go to the formulas of the vial representation and the matrix, the matrix for the generators of SL2 look like this. Okay. So this is just, it's not intent to teach anything but the fact that to make a point, which is the vial representation is explicit. One can compute things. Um, so, yeah. Okay, and what else comes with a lattice, right? So the Hermitian symmetric domain, right? And a, a standard sort of arithmetic group that acts on it. And a, an period domain, right, which is the quotient. And the sort of the, yeah, the, the, the spectacular result here is, is Bailey Borel, which says that, uh, that this thing is a quasi projective variety uh, of, so we are assuming this is not necessary, right? But we are assuming M is has signature little M comma two. So, um, so this thing has dimension little m uh, and uh, admits a normal compactification with boundary of co-dimension bigger than two. Actually, if, if, the, if m has signature little m comma two, the boundary is one dimensional. So it's points and curves. Um, but anyhow, so... Um, so yeah, so and, and this space has natural divisors, uh, which are called Heckner divisors. Um, so for each element, little v in the dual, uh, the lattice, you consider this hyperplane, right? So it's a, this hyperplane, right, uh, intersected with this sort of real quadrant, um, and. Uh, yeah, and if you fix a rational number and an element in the discriminant, so 
you take the union of all these hyperplanes, right, where V has fixed uh, square and fixed uh, congruence class, right, fixed class in the discriminant. So uh, this set of hyperplanes is, uh, is invariant by this arithmetic group. So one can consider the quotient and actually the quotient, uh, so this descends, this is a gamma M invariant and descends to a Cartier divisor, which is called Heckner divisor. And its class is parameterized by an element in the discriminant group and the square. So a, a square, right, fixing a square. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I really apologize for, for all this uh, sort of, yeah, but uh, it's necessary to state Borcher's theorem. Um, okay, so let me summarize. So you have a lattice, it has that signature. We will assume so that the statement is simpler that M is even, and that's not necessary, but then one has to replace SL2 by, by, a, by a double cover by the metaplectic group. Anyhow, M even, lattice of that signature, then we have the discriminant group, gamma, an element in the discriminant group, and we write like this, the corresponding element on the group algebra. Yeah. We have the Weyl representation, uh, which is, uh, is concrete. And then, so uh, yeah, for, for every element in actually in the dual of M, a half their square lives in something like this, right? Where n is actually the smallest possible, so it's the smallest integer for which the vial representation evaluated at this element is the identity. Um, okay, so then if I fix a number here and an element in the discriminant group, I have a divisor. It might be empty. If the divisor is empty, then I just declare it to be zero, okay? And yeah, the theorem, Borch's theorem says that if you put all this together in a generating series, right, you sum over all possible element in the discriminant group and for each fixed one, right, then I look at all possible ends, okay? And I put this, this variable here, I right, to keep track of them. Then this element lives in here, it's a modular form for the full SL2 with this weight and this representation with coefficients, uh, Hegner divisors as coefficients. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, can, I ask, can I ask what's the simplest example? So like something about elliptic curves, or I don't know, like CM points on, on uh, yeah, that's a good, and then, then which concrete modular form you get? That's a, that's a good question. Um, uh, Just like, what's the simplest instance where it would make sense? Well, I mean, in principle, this makes sense for every lattice. Yeah? Even lattice of, uh, sorry, even lattice of signature M comma two. Okay. Um, but I mean, yeah, I will show you a concrete example, right? I mean, that's what we had to do. Um, but uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, uh, um, because it's, yeah, so this is all a little bit new to me, but it's also, um, I don't know if it's known, right? Like which modular forms can be realized as, as Borch's modular form, right? That, that's also a, um, so, um, but yeah, I, so I, I will show you a concrete example when we go to the Gusho Mukai story. Um, so, yeah, so you, you see here, okay, so let me give you one sort of application of this. Yeah, This PM uh, is normal. All right, uh, so, so there is a map like this. Yeah. It's a normal scheme. So um, there is a map, right, uh, that associates a Cartier divisor, a Weyl divisor, right, a modular linear equivalent. Now there is an isomorphism like this, and this is the fact that the boundary has high co-dimension. And there is a map like this, that is the degree, right? I mean, this is a projective variety. So you put it inside a projective space, uh, and then uh, you can map, right, uh, uh, a divisor 
to set by counting each degree, right? Intersecting with the co-dimension one uh, sort of, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, so, so you have an ample line bundle, right? Then you, you cap it, you uh, intersect it with uh, ample line bundle to the power, the corresponding uh, power, right? So that you get an ample. The, yeah, the degree, if you fix an embedding into some projective space, this is just the degree. So let me call this whole composition the degree, okay? So this is a, a group homomorphism. So now I can consider this map, right? Where instead of having Hegner divisors, I just put their degrees. So, so this is how the, the generating function looks like. So this is a vector valued modular form, right? By Borchers here. Um, uh, So, so yeah, so, so now, uh, I mean, uh, so already when we are at this point, uh, we know that, I mean, there is, there, are, there is a lot of literature on this, but in particular, so, so this, this theorem, Knob Mason, um, uh, where if you have a vector valued modular form, you take its Fourier expansion, right? Then coefficients cannot grow more than polynomially. And then this, so the, the degree of the polynomial is the weight plus alpha, and this alpha depends on the representation, on the type. Any case for us, okay, so for us, we immediately have this, right? The degree of irrationality of these divisors is polynomially bounded, um, but, but we can do much better for K3s. Um, one can, I mean, you can exploit the fact that, uh, that the representation is actually uh, explicit. And then you study eigenvalues, eigenspaces, and try to make this into a scalar valued modular form, right? Where, where, uh, where bounds are better on the growth. So can I, can I square the K3s on this picture? So, no, uh, yeah, so, so far, I mean, that's what I'm saying that if, if you put, so if, if you do this, for concrete sort of, okay, so it, it, this, the story with K3s is that, okay, the lattice is concrete, right? And then you have this sub, so you have this Hegner divisor which correspond to special uh, modular objects, right? Special cubic four folds, special Gushel Mukai, blah, blah, blah. Um, so then, uh, yeah, and, uh, and once you, you sit down and you try to, write, to, to understand the vial representation, um, you see that, I mean, one can study sort of eigen um, uh, vectors, right? So say, okay, so, so uh, maybe even, I mean, actually this happens, right? That there is a congruence group, small enough, but still congruence group for which the vial representation is trivial when restricted there. So in particular, any of these ones will just be a scalar valued modular form. And then for those, there is a basis, you have, Cusps, which grow, the, their coefficients grow very small, uh, slow, and Eisenstein series. And Eisenstein series, their coefficients are explicit. So, so then that's why you, yeah, I mean. Uh, I think I had a more basic inference. Do you mean like in the space of all cubic four folds, this Hegner divisors would be special cubic four folds? Is this what you're saying? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So, I mean, this, so this is not, K3, this is not a, so when I say, so for concrete, Examples, this can we can we can do better, right? If if we fix, um, you know, if we fix the lattice, and then we study concretely the vial representation, we can do better. We can find better bounds. And then the point is that the K threes are, uh, they are so in these three sort of in the A, B, and C range, K threes are going to be by rational to Hegner divisors. So. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so I have 15 minutes. So, um, okay, so I, I should say, all right, so this um, this was used by Molik and Pandaripande, so Borch's theorem, to study uh, degrees of uh, Nether-Lefschetz divisors on, on concrete families of, of quasi-polarized K3s. Um, and um, uh, Li and uh, Shang, they use this to compute uh, the degree of inside the, inside the projective space of cubic fourfolds. Uh, 
kind of cubic polynomials. Um, uh, the degree of the locus of those that have discriminant that are special with discriminant D. Um, and this was our so this this was our starting point actually. Um, because um, yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, maybe I should say something about that. Um, okay, so cubic fourfolds, right? And then this is the moduli of cubic fourfolds. Okay, and then there is a period map here, right? Um, so we know that, I mean, so this is, um, let me just keep it vague, but, but it's, I think it's, it's sort of an important discussion of, a, a, so this is the moduli of special cubic fourfolds of discriminant D, right? Um, and, a, and then a, a PGL, right, a fix, so it doesn't change the discriminant, right? So the orbit over this point, uh, so uh, this is gonna be a PGL six bundle over the base, right? So it's by rational to the base times P35. Um, and uh, yeah, and this for infinitely many Gs, right? So this is condition A, right? In, in, in in, in our theorem, these are either by rational or admit a degree two map to FG. So, um, but yeah, the point is that, so Lee and Chang, they have a, they have a, a modular form, which is explicit and computes the degrees of, of these objects, right? But a uh, comparing, so one can bound the degree of irrationality, right, here. But um, the point is that comparing uh, the degree of irrationality of the base with the one here, right? This is a very, very subtle matter. So in, in general, right? This, so if, if you think about this being one or not, right? This has to do with, with when in algebraic geometry, the question of a variety, when a variety is stably rational and not rational is an extremely, extremely hard question, right? Which has to do with when Right, uh, this is one and this is not one. So, uh, so we sort of had to drop this picture, right? Um, and uh, and the point is that by choosing the the Bailey Borel degree, we lose control over which explicit modular form we get, uh, but um, but we circumvent this this difficulty, right? So. Um, Okay, so, so let me tell you, maybe, maybe I should skip some slides here. Uh, um, yeah, I will, okay, so, um, okay, let me do a little bit, yeah, okay. So, uh, Gushel Mukai Forfolds, yeah, I, I think if, if um, okay, Gushel Mukai Forfolds. So, the Grassmannian, yeah, G, R, two, and then five here. Um, Okay, yeah, I'm trying to think which slides to skip. I, I will skip some and then so because I want to arrive to the to the discussion at the end about the uniform bound. Um, okay, so the Grassmannian G25, so GR25, right? This sits by Plucker, right? This sits there. And then you take the cone over it. Yeah, so so you are there, and then you take one dimension higher and you take the cone over it. Okay, so this is a P10, uh, right? Five choose two minus one plus one here. Um, and a, an intersection as follows, right? So the cone, you intersect it with a quadric and then with a linear space of dimension eight. This is what is called a Gushel Mukai fourfold. Okay. And then uh, there is a Gushel Mukai map, which is projection from the vertex. Okay. So um, yeah, this makes, so uh, this is a fan of variety of index two um, and a degree 10. And actually every fan of variety of a uh, fan of fourfold of degree 10 and index two uh, is of this form. Okay, and the vanishing cohomology is the cohomology, you take away everything that comes from the Grassmannian. Uh, so this is a lattice of this shape. So, um, so this is a unimodular part. 
So here you already see that the discriminant group of this thing will be the one that we studied before. Uh, and it has this signature. And the corresponding period domain has dimension 20, it's a quasi predictive variety. And then you say that, okay, so a Gusha Mugai fourfold is special. Yeah? If, so in general, there is an equality here if X is very general. So H22 classes, the only ones there are are those that come from the Grassmannian. Um, but uh, yeah, so we say that X is a special if, um, if there is a primitive uh, rank three sub lattice here containing the, the, the cohomology classes of the Grassmannian. And then the discriminant of such can be either zero, two, or four mod A. Right, so, so this is where this numerology uh, uh, starts appearing. Um, and then, yeah, again, so, okay, so let me skip a little bit here. Uh, so the point is that this, if, okay, so you say that here, okay, so this is a Gushel Mugai together with uh, this rank three sub lattice of discriminant D containing the cohomology of the Grassmannian. So you say that a K3 is associated to it if there is a lattice isomorphism like this. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it has to be Hodge, yeah, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, and the point is that so uh, if, if the discriminant is two or four mod eight and not divisible by any prime congruent to three mod four, right, then this, this sort of Hodge theoretic identification gives you a birational isomorphism between FG and DD. And this, this, this changes, right? I mean, um, depending on D. But um, the key point here is that this, these are all Hegner divisors. So actually this is the explicit thing. So let me give you the formula here, right? I mean, these are parameterized by a rational number and a class in the discriminant group, which is this, is the group that we, we put before as an example. Um, so, uh, okay, so yeah, so I, if I, I mean, if I make the generating series of all these, of the degree of all Hegner divisors, um, so this is a modular form of weight 11 and type the representation for, for the Gushel Mukai lattice, right? And this is, the, yeah, so uh, Borchers here gives me the fact that um, this thing is, yeah, is, is modular. But now, the, if you look at eigenvalues and eigenvectors for this row, one actually can conclude that if you take the sum here of the coefficients, forget about the vector space, right? So um, if you take the sum of all the coefficients, right, then this is actually a modular form of weight 11 scalar value for this group and this character. Um, And um, yeah, and now, now it comes sort of classical theory here. Uh, so modular forms for some congruence group, some weight, and, and these uh, Dirichlet characters, uh, they split, right? As, so if you take the, the Fourier expansion here at infinity, so this always has a cusp at infinity, right? And you take this Fourier expansion. So this breaks into cusp forms and Eisenstein series. And then there is this classical result of Hecke from the 30s that says that the Fourier coefficients of a cusp form, they are bounded by a weight over two. And the Fourier coefficients of the Eisenstein series, they all look like the Eisenstein series, their coefficients actually look like this for some constant. These are some L functions. Um, in any case, they are bounded by something like that. So, uh, sum over divisors of n, and then you take the power. Uh, and yeah, this is so. This is the same sum. I'm just summing over the reciprocal divisor. Instead of d, I take n over t. Um, this is sort of a classical inequality, but I, I it's so pretty that I, I wanted to put it. Uh, so this is certainly less than or equal than summing over all these, right? And just summing over divisors here. 
And this, you see here that n to the power k minus one goes out. And the, the, the sum here is the Riemann zeta function evaluated at k minus one. Um, and, and this thing, yeah, this, so as long as, uh, so the real part here has to be bigger than one, right, for this to converge. So, but anyhow, the weight here is 11. K for us is 11. So, so this is just a constant times n to the power 10, right? So, so we, get, we get this. Um, and yeah, and uh, I think I, think I uh, so let me just say, I don't know, without, without going into the slides, because maybe it's too much constant, but the uniform bound, the way to obtain it is by, um, there is a generalization of Borchers result that you could ask, right? Like what happens if instead of taking divisors, I take higher co-dimensional hyperplanes, right? So uh, higher co-dimension linear spaces, right? Um, so this has this form, right? So you take, you can take, you know, various vectors and then look at the orthogonal of them. And then, um, so this gives you this descent, instead of descending to a, a device, or it descends to a cycle. And the question, um, good last question is whether the same modularity statement holds, right? Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, so yeah, essentially it's, it's like this, is this a modular form, right? One has to give it last names, right? For which group, which blah, blah, blah. But, but essentially is that, is this a modular form, right? It's, it's gonna be for the Siegel upper half plane now and so on. But, um, and the answer is yes, right? And Kudla Milson, they gave a proof for this for cohomology, then uh, Wei Chang prove, uh, proved it under certain conditions, um, some, some convergency conditions. Uh, but uh, finally, yeah, there is a there is a proof now by um, a full proof by Brunier and uh, Westerholt Haum. So this is one person right? um, where uh, this is true. So uh, so essentially, we follow the same strategy, but using Kudla modularity conje uh, conjecture. And and the, the remaining question is how to put all FGs inside the same period domain for some lattice, right? And um, yeah, and uh, and this 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 can be done, right? Uh, um, uh, this is so here some some reference. Uh, so uh, or uh, Skorobugato, right? They they have this. Um, they study this unimodular lattice that contains all K three lattices, and what happened when you go to P, when you go to the quotient? They study the degree of this map, and they link it to the number of Fourier Mukai partners of a general K three, and. Uh, and, and that's how we go. But yeah, I, I'm, I think I, I overdid it here. Yeah. Anyhow, okay, <laughs> I will stop. I'm, I'm sorry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a bit heavy notation, this, this story, but yeah. So are there any further questions, remark, remarks? Ooh. So if you just want to know the polynomial boundness, not, not the exact powers, so how much of the non-trivial number theory input do you need? So there were very subtle things from number theory, but if we just want some polynomial bound, is it easier to get? Some polynomial bound, you mean? Uh, yeah. Well, the only... Uh... Yeah, so, okay, is this... this... So the, the yeah, some polynomial bound is this this theorem that I that I gave you at the beginning, right? That for every vector valued modular form, there is a polynomial bound. Yeah, and uh, and then it's it's always weight plus something, and that something uh, has to do with the representation, uh, and then uh, yeah, and then that's a special. I mean, then you don't you don't get like a uniform for all representations, blah, right? That this depends on how the representation acts. Uh, but, but yeah, but in, in a sense, I mean, I, I think in, in this whole story, sort of the by representation is the easiest one you can get. Um, it's, it's the most natural attached to a lattice. So a lot is known about it, but uh, yeah. But I think, I mean, the, once you have modularity, then the rest is really, uh, 
you know, linear algebra somehow. Like um, you just check for eigenvalues and then um, if I take twice the coefficients here minus this one, maybe the eigenspaces, right? And then, uh, then you, you bring it down to scalar values. But um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. The, the, yeah. But still the mother of questions uh, here is, is how to do this for MG or AG, I think. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if, if anyone has an input there, it would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> so can I ask, um, so I mean, you know, when you discuss Kushal Mokai four faults, I mean, did you actually use anything about the geometry about Kushal Mokai four faults or did you just use the lattice? Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's just the lattice and then the, um, uh, the fact that FG maps by rationally into special Gushel Mukai forms in the lattice, right? Because also the period map for Gushel Mukai contracts stuff, right? Uh, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, the whole identification is, is Hodge theoretic. Um, so I mean, could could we make up other lattice constructions where we don't use A2 or A1 plus two, but some other lattice? So. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. And then, um, uh, I mean, in principle, sort of the last the last contract con uh, construction actually uh, uses that, right? I mean, you put FG in a lattice that is no longer geometric. Uh, I mean, geometric. I don't know. It doesn't have you know a, a, a modular space behind it. It's just a lattice. Um, and uh, yeah, the question is whether like. So yeah, actually, yeah, yes, that, that's that's how we do it for in general for all G, right? Um, and 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 if you can do it for smaller lattice so to, to bring down the degree, uh, I I don't think so because I think like the the fact that it's unimodular sort of plays plays a, a key role. So uh, I think the so yeah the lattice story uh, you cannot extract more from it. I think I think. Um, Still, is so it's it's highly expected somehow that the degree of irrationality should be much smaller than the degree, right? I mean, it's not true for a variety that the degree of irrationality is realized as the degree for some embedding, right? That's 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 simply not true. Uh, and we are so we bound here the degrees, right? Uh, so, yeah. So you can ask in this argument. So this FG is which projective space do they sit? Do they all sit? They all sit in the Bo in the Bailey Borel, right? A compactification of a lattice that has signature twenty six comma two. So, uh, and I don't know what the project is, so what the dimension of the projective space is. I just know that there is one because of Bailey Borel, right? There is a, a, a there is an ample line band. That's it, right? So then you fix uh, that and then you work with that. But I don't know, yeah. If, if you ask me for the value of M, I don't know. And I don't think that's an easy question. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> like it has to do with, you know, we know for which power the, the, the Hodge class Lambda is very ample, right? And then, uh, and then trying to look at sections. I don't know, I don't know. But, but a priori without modular forms, is it clear that all these FGs should sit in some, that it's true? It? It's true that they sit in some projective space. And... Well, I mean, so a priori, I mean, this is sort of the last the, the last construction I gave you, right? Which they don't sit inside; they, they map finitely, right? Uh, and then and then for infinitely many, yeah, you can write like uh, cubics and so on. Uh, but a priori, like just yes, because of Boom, I, I don't know. I, yeah. But they, they do, they, they all map finitely into something inside the, the same projective space, which is gonna be impossible for MG and AG, right? So yeah, this is special for this collection of modular spaces. All right.
if there are no more questions, uh, then uh, let's thank uh, Ignacio again. Uh, and then I guess the